call the meeting to order. Welcome everyone. It is Thursday, September 5th, 2013. This is the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees regular meeting. Time is seven o'clock. Uh, and I'd ask uh, us, uh, where is our, there she is. Ms. Clerk, would you please call the roll? President Sells. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. Trustee Hamilton. Here. Trustee Ballery. Here. Trustee Collins. Here. Trustee Foley. Here. Village Attorney Molina. Here. Village Attorney Mars. Here. Also present Village Clerk Kathy Haley. Not present this evening, Trustee Suskin. Thank you very much. We have a quorum. If you'll please rise for the pledge. Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you everyone in the audience for attending and thank you to those folks who are watching at home. Uh, if you are here with us tonight and if at any point you would like to make a comment to the board about uh, either anything on the agenda or otherwise, we just ask that you be recognized uh, by me and that you make your comments from the podium so that the folks at home can hear you and, and see what you have to say. First up tonight uh, are presentations and public comment and we have a happy occasion. We're going to be swearing in a new patrol officer. Officer Isaac Hamilton. So I'd ask uh, Chief Weitzel to please do the honors. Uh, President Sells and um, trustees and Manager Scalera, I'm going to brief you on Isaac in a moment. Um, if the clerk wants to do the swearing in first, then I'll introduce uh, Isaac to the board and have Isaac come up and uh, introduce his family and uh, trust the board. James Hamilton do solemnly swear. I, Isaac James Hamilton, do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And that I will faithfully perform the duties. And I will faithfully perform the duties. Of patrol officer for the village of Riverside. For patrol officer of the village of Riverside. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Congratulations. Thank you. President Sells, let me uh, introduce Isaac. His family is here tonight, but I'll have Isaac handle that. But I just wanted to tell you a little bit about him. He has completed the F uh, State Police Academy several months ago, and he had to go through three months of field training before I, I brought him to the board because we wanted to make sure he passed. You can obviously see that probably wasn't a problem. Um, Isaac was in the 94 percentile at the Illinois State Police Academy. He was one of the top graduates there, both academically and physically. He grew up in Wisconsin. He attended uh, school uh, for a short time at Carroll University in Waukesha and finished up his college degree at North Central College uh, and graduating with a, a degree in social and criminal, uh, social, criminal, social justice. He played football both in high school and college, as you can probably tell. Um, his, his wife, Christian, is here and their daughter, Jay Lee, and I'll have, I'll have like I said, uh, Isaac introduced them. Before coming to Riverside, he actually did some uh, work for a security company and also worked as a service manager for Menards. Um, so he had a great deal of experience. Um, he wasn't right out of college coming to us. He had work experience. And when we interviewed Isaac, he told the police and fire commissioners that he had been taking several tests and had almost given up on getting into law enforcement because um, he either didn't end up as high as he would have liked to have gotten selected or he did end up high and he was being bumped down a little bit because some people would have preference points such as military points or other points that were given um, during the testing process. So he applied for Riverside and um, he was uh, at the, towards the top of the list and it was extremely uh, gratifying to get the job. He's an outstanding individual. He's presently working the three to 11 shift here in uh, Riverside permanently, at least for now. 
And um, as you can see, many of the officers are here, including several of his officers that trained him, his field training officers are here. Uh, currently lives in Plainfield and um, usually gets to work about an hour and a half early and doesn't put in for overtime. So uh, he's enthusiastic, um, wants to be here. And I'd ask him to step up and maybe he can introduce um, his wife if they want to come up and your daughter. And if you want to, uh, the board has any questions or you want to address them, it would be great. <laughs> This is my wife, Kristen, and uh, there's actually two in here. Uh, uh, soon to be a daughter, Gabrielle, and a son, Isaac Jr. And this little one who's too shy to stand up here is my, my five-year-old daughter, JL. Um, they're very happy here. I'm happy here. I mean, I can't believe it. This is a great town, great place to be. I enjoy every minute of it. And uh, I believe she likes it, too. She got to play around the squad car today, which came in a little early. So, yeah, that's good. Any questions for me? Before, before the board, um, I would like to just point out that um, I've known Isaac, um, the first time I met him was downstairs, and um, from that very first moment, um, I knew that we had an asset here in, in Riverside. He will complement the high caliber of officers that we have working for this community, and he's going to be a, a perfect fit for us, so welcome, Isaac. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, uh, I fir first met Officer Hamilton at the Junior's Rodeo, and the kids, they loved him. So it's a, that 3 to 11 shift, that's going to be it's gonna be perfect. Get a lot of interaction with the kids. So Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, and Chief, while you're up there, I believe you now are going to tell us a little bit about uh, Explorer Post Awards. Yeah, I asked uh, Officer Greenwald to step up, and I believe he brought some Explorers. But I would just like to brief the board, and then he could brief the board on exactly what happened at the Explorer Conference. The reason I asked him to come let's brief the board is the, the Village of Riverside um, and the police department has supported the Explorers for many years. This year, the, the state conference was held in, held in Springfield earlier this month, and they brought home three trophies from the competition, which had over 200 Explorers from 30 posts attending. As you can see, he has um, some of the explorers here. But I'm going to let turn it over to Brian, and he's going to uh, can brief the board and answer any questions the board may have on uh, the competition. Brian? Uh, every year, the Explorer Post takes uh, explorers to either the state or national conference. Uh, this year was a state conference. On the even years, it's the national conference. Last year, we went to Colorado. Next year, we'll be in uh, Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, this year, like I said, it was a state conference in Springfield. Uh, it brings explorers from all across the state uh, to, to participate in seminars and competition um, that we train for all year. And this year we were fortunate enough to bring home three trophies, which is the first time we brought home trophies since 1999. So I was extremely happy. The kids worked hard all year um, and it was a great conference. They learned a lot. Uh, they get the chance to learn from other advisors uh, because when they're participating, we're judging or we're role playing. So it's a, uh, it's a great opportunity for them. Uh, as a former explorer, I had a blast at the conferences, so I try to make sure that I get them to them every year. Um, so I want to thank the board for letting us have the program, because without your support, we wouldn't have a program here. And it gives, uh, gives them a great opportunity. So any questions? Introduce them to us. Sure. This is Ryan Blecka, uh, Joe Metcalf Reyes, Tim Drulis, and Kyle Longino. And what were the trophies for? The trophies were for the, the second place in the team building obstacle course. Uh, it's a timed obstacle course they have to do um, as a team. They can't complete the obstacles on their own, so they have to work together in order to complete it. Uh, they received fourth place in the bomb scene search, um, which basically they have to go find an explosive device somewhere in a hotel room. And then they received third place in the felony suspect arrest where they uh, have to apprehend somebody that's wanted on a warrant. So again, I was extremely happy with the results and extremely proud of them. 
And I have one more explorer that was part of these teams that could make it tonight, and that's Danny Sherrill. So. Well, congratulations. You know, it's funny that you should be thank thanking us for having the program because they perform a great service to our village. At, at events like the, the, the 4th of July, 3rd of July, RAW, they're a great help to us. And congratulations to you too, Officer Greenewald, because your leadership <laughs> has a lot to do with their success and their becoming fine young men. Thank, thank you very you. much. Anybody else? In closing, I'll tell the board that we're one of the smallest posts that attends the conference, so I mean, I am extremely proud of these young men. And you should know we've had several young men that once they turn 21 have gone on to, and work as full-time law enforcement. There are several graduates from our post that are in law enforcement. Um, um, as, as far away as Oswego, we have one of our explorers is working as a police officer there now. So what they learn here really does help them through their college years and then into their pro chosen profession. So. Well, maybe in a few years, one of them will be standing up there, and they'll have their wife with twins. <laughs> yeah. A few would, years. With some a few of these years. kids, I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> as, far, as far as being. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chief Weitzel. Next up, we have a presentation on uh, the Comet Smart Meters. We have with us Mike McMahon, uh, VP of AMI Implementation, and Fabiola Amakuza from uh, Comet's External Affairs Department. So, yes, please. I'm Mike McMahon, I'm the Vice President of Advanced Meter Infrastructure Implementation. And uh, I can promise you I will uh, neither be as uplifting nor inspiring as the previous two uh, speakers. That was, that was something to be proud of, I tell you. Um, we're starting our meter deployment. Uh, this is, uh, we started uh, two days ago. Uh, we're starting the meter deployment. Uh, we'll roll out four million meters across the entire Comet Service Territory. 11,500 miles of uh, northern Illinois. Uh, we'll be in your community uh, the week of 9-8, and then we'll go away for a while. We'll come back 11-24, and we'll finish it up. You might say, well, why go away and come back? It has to do with, we follow the deployment based on the, uh, the meter read routes. That's for the best efficiency. And we also uh, build on the existing mesh network. So you like to put in a meter where it has an adjacent meter installed. So if you look at it, we're kind of at the periphery of Riverside the week of 9-8, and then we'll come back in and finish, finish it uh, the week of 11-24. Uh, and then we're done. And uh, meters will immediately start delivering benefits to your residents. They'll be able to see uh, their real-time interval usage on the web. Starting the very next week, they'll be able to uh, sign up for usage alerts and uh, we'll be able to ping the meters during storms. You still have to call when you're having an outage. Uh, we, we eventually will get to the point where we'll have automatic outage detection off of the meters into our outage management system. We're not there yet. We've got a couple software programs that have to be put in place that will probably be 2015 before we're there. So if you have an outage, you still have to call. I want to emphasize that. But we're on the, we have a roadmap to how we get to that. So better ed energy management tools, uh, better <coughs> usage alerts, identification of your, <coughs> identification of your uh, usage on the web on real time, and you'd also be able to sign up for different dynamic pricing schemes uh, right away. <coughs> Automatic meters means we don't have to read your meters in your yard anymore. We will one time after the meter is installed, and then I think that's an improvement in safety, not having a meter reader have to go in people's backyards, intrude on their private property. So that's what you'll get right away. Uh, I'll just pause right there just quickly to thank you for the support we've had here, and, the, and the, we've off to a good start. We're looking forward to a, a safe and efficient deployment. I'll pause there for questions. 
I'll either the trustees or anyone in the audience has any questions. What is dynamic pricing policy? Sure, right now, most people, almost everybody is on a, what's called a flat rate. So you pay the same price for electricity every hour of the day, day or night. In real time markets, the price of electricity fluctuates on an hourly basis. The fact is at night, the country is awash in electricity because everybody's asleep, everything's turned off. So when you go to what's called a real time pricing model, you pay the price of elect the real price of electricity at that point during the day. So if you can shift your load from daytime use where prices are high to nighttime use where prices are low, you can save money that way. Particularly so the, the, the people that can most benefit, although every person I know that signed up for real-time pricing reports savings. Every single person, I, and it's just anecdotal, but I ask. But the real person that benefits the most is the, is the person that works and is not home during the day. That's when electricity prices are highest. They get home, they turn on their electricity. If you can shift your load by doing your wash at night, or your dishwasher at night, your clothes washing at night, things like that, uh, you can save some money. Uh, particularly if you have an electric vehicle, if you charge that at night, the rates are much lower. That's a program called Real-Time Pricing from ComEd. You can sign up for it as soon as you get a smart meter. It's available in My Energy Tools on the ComEd.com website. And how does that work when we uh, have a outside source for our electricity? Well, great question, great question. Because uh, I just signed up, I just signed up, tried to sign up for real-time rates from ComEd uh, last week. And uh, <clears throat> you, you can't do it if you're having a different energy supplier. So the real-time rates are only if ComEd supplies your electricity. So as an individual, you'd have to drop current supplier and then come back to ComEd as your energy supplier and then you can go on real-time rates. So you have to do an assessment on whether you're going to get a better deal with one place or the other. Uh, the residential energy suppliers, I'm not sure who the supplier for Riverside is. Who is it? Who is it? Um, First Energy. First Energy, okay. A lot of the reses are coming and they, they're asking us uh, to give them some data so they can start designing uh, alternate rate structures and we're supporting that effort. We think that's a good thing to do. Probably the market that's most advanced is Texas. Texas has hundreds of different rate structures. I mean, they, they have like, there's a rate structure down there that says free electricity on the weekends. Remember the old phone things? You don't call mom on the weekend, wait till five after Friday. Free electricity on the weekends. During the week you pay higher. So. Because the meters read the energy on an hourly interval for residential meters, you can do all kinds of different price structures. You can do what's called time of use, meaning between like 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. you pay one rate, 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. you pay another rate. You can go to real-time pricing where you pay the actual rate on each individual hour. You can block it up any way you want. So it's going to enable a lot of different pricing plans to come forward into the and my last question is, how will our residents know um, when or who's doing the work? Uh, yeah. Will someone knock on their door, yeah. uh, identify themselves, have a badge, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So uh, you got the little packet? OK, so uh, well, this is just the end state. We start about 120 days in advance with a, uh, some general awareness information. Uh, about 30 days in advance, they get, now you're a little different because the time frame was compressed. But everybody who's getting a smart meter, uh, probably not the people 1124 yet, but 30 days prior to, so certainly the people in the week of 9 8 have got what's called a 30 day deployment letter. It's a letter from ComEd, signed by yours truly, that says, Congratulations, you're getting a smart meter. We're going to be in your neighborhood the week of installing smart meters. There'll be a person in a comment uniform. They will knock on a person's door the day of. They will attempt to contact the customer the day of. You'll get a phone call the week before. It'll be a robo call, it won't be a real person. But you'll get a phone call the week before saying we're gonna be in your neighborhood installing meters next week. And then the day of, the actual meter installer who's in a comment uniform will actually knock on the door. 
If somebody's home, he'll engage them, tell them what's happening, etc. But you don't have to be home for the meter installer to install the meter. If the meter's installed successfully, there'll be a door hanger put on your, put on your door saying smart meter installed today. You're, and in each one of these, the robocall, the 30-day deployment letter, and this, there's a possibility that your power will be interrupted for a short period of time, maybe about 10 minutes. Uh, so we, we say here, go around and check your clocks and I'll reset your clocks. So at least three personal notifications to the resident, 30-day, um, robocall, day of with a door knock. <laughs> if you don't, if we're not successful, you get a different door hanger saying, sorry, we missed you, we'll call for an appointment. Any other questions? Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, is there any, is, if you're registered, you know, on, on ComEd for your account, uh -huh. is that, is it evident if you look up your account when your meter, you know, whether you're scheduled for 9, 8 or? I don't, I don't think you can see it on the website. Okay. I don't think you can see the installation on the website. Thank you. Actually, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> Let me, you might see it. You, mm -hmm. 1124, you might see it. I'm going to look it up. That's, that's not a bad idea. Let me think about that. Let me see if we can. Right. Yes. Of course, and I read in the newspaper this week that there was fires. Yeah. Uh, from the installation of these meters. Yeah. Has that been addressed and taken care of? Yeah. All meters. When we had we had a pilot in about 2007 through 2010, we installed 130,000 meters in the uh, what was called Innovation Corridor. You're pretty close to it. Uh, in that 130,000 meters. We had uh, three incidents of meters overheating. Now, I didn't want to get cute with it. We called them fires. But it was damage to the meter, and there was some smoke damage around the enclosure. That's what it was. But, I, you know, you don't, you don't want to get, you know, legalistic at everything. So fires, we called them fires. We had three occurrences of those. We investigated each case of that. In each case, we took the meter that was involved in that, and we sent it off to two independent forensic labs to see what the cause of the uh, fire was. In all cases, those forensic labs came back and told us the meter was not the cause of the fire. The cause of the fire was the socket, the meter socket. Now, the socket, we own the meter, uh, you own the socket. And so the meter is new. The socket's usually about the age of the home. So what we took away from that was we needed to do a better job on assessing the condition of the socket or the meter fitting. And we needed to put into place actions in case that meter socket or meter fitting was not, uh, had, had some problems with it that needed to be remediated. So what, what have we done about that? Uh, we enhanced the training of our meter installers, specifically around the inspection and identification of the socket and the meter fitting. Now, when they open the, open the meter fitting, they'll inspect that socket. If the socket has any issues with it at all, they, we have a uh, licensed electrician on call with a one hour show up time. They'll come out to the house and they'll make the necessary repairs. No cost to the specific customer. It goes into the AMI investment as recovered through normal rates, but no cost to the uh, uh, specific customer. Now we, we expect that we'll have that about uh, one quarter of one percent of the time, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's one out of 300 meters, and we're installing four million. And in fact, we've had two occurrences of that so far. We installed we've installed about 305 meters a day uh, in the past two days, and both days we've called our on-call electrician to come out and make repairs. Uh, we haven't found anybody that's disappointed. We're making repairs to their equipment and restoring those to a, to a good condition. Is that good enough? I got more. <laughs> I, I can go more, but that, that was the major finding. That was the major finding, which we, which we have addressed in that way. Any other questions from anyone? Sir, thank you very much. OK, very thank you. We thanks, appreciate for the, it. thanks for the help, and we're looking forward to bringing the benefits of smart meters and a modern grid to Riverside. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next up is public comment.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Gint Lietsovninkas, 265 Northwood Road. I am a board member with the Frederick Law Olmsted Society of Riverside, and I come to you um, as I try to do each month uh, to provide you with uh, updates on what the, the society is doing. Um, the society, the board members meet uh, every month throughout the year uh, privately, but two uh, meetings out of the year we uh, have open meetings and we invite not only the members of the Olmsted Society to join us, but also the general public. And our next meeting on the 1st of October will be an open meeting, so we invite everyone who's interested to uh, learn more about what the Olmsted Society uh, does um, to come and join us at that meeting. It's, it'll be at 7.30 again on the 1st of October, uh, it'll be at the Scout Cabin. Uh, and there'll be some uh, light refreshments and fare served as well uh, after the meeting. So we encourage all of you to join us. Our next landscape work day is scheduled for uh, this coming Saturday, the 7th, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., 12 noon. It'll be along Riverside Road near Olmsted. I want to talk a little bit more about this particular work day because um, it's, it's a work in progress. Um, we worked along this area, along the river, uh, for the last three years, uh, removing a lot of invasive species and uh, planted over $700 worth of uh, native grasses and sedges donated by the this, this society to reveal the, the view of the river. And so if some of you have noticed uh, along Riverside Drive there, there's a much better view of the river. And our goal is to uh, continue to do that along the riverbank as much as we can, and so this Saturday we'll be doing much of the same, removing some um, invasive species, and we'll be planting uh, $800 worth of, of native grasses and sedges, again, being donated by the society. Um, if, um, and later on this fall, we actually, later on this fall, we're uh, looking to do a prescribed burn as well to uh, help control some of that, uh, those invasive species. Um, with the invasive weeds removed, we found numerous native species such as uh, cup plant, Solomon seal, wild indigo, woodland sunflower, dozens of oak tree seedlings, uh, elm-leaved goldenrod, riverbank wild rye, switchgrass, and wafer ash. So it's, uh, it's quite a surprise to see a lot of these things coming uh, through after the weeds have been removed. So hopefully you can get a chance to see them for yourself. Uh, Floss and the Riverside Library are co-sponsors of an ongoing lecture series on a variety of topics related to design, landscape, and the environment. Our next lecture will take place on the 26th of September, Thursday evening in the Great Room at the library. The, the speaker for that evening will be uh, Guy McPherson, who is a professor Emeritus of Natural Resources and the Environment at the University of Arizona, where he taught and conducted research uh, focused on conservation and biological diversity. Uh, he lives in an off-grid straw bale house where he puts into practice his lifelong interest in sustainable living via organic gardening, raising small animals for eggs and milk, and working with members of his rural community. So, uh, sounds like it'll be an interesting discussion uh, about his real life experiences and living off the grid and uh, hopefully many of you will join us that evening to hear about that. Um, our next walking tour, the Olmsted's walking tour, will take place on the 22nd Sunday from uh, 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, we meet at the main, main train station on the east platform. Uh, we've had actually a very good year this year with uh, bringing in uh, guests to Riverside to, to go on the tour. So far, we've had about 170 uh, people participate in the tour, uh, and we're projecting about 225 overall will have participated this year. And that's in addition to uh, a tour given to 208th graders uh, by some of our docents uh, that took place in, in June. Also, uh, upcoming is uh, FRED, otherwise known as Frederick Law Olmsted in Riverside Education and Design. Uh, that will take place on Saturday, the 21st of September. Um, our first one took place last year. This one is FRED 2013. It's a day of classes, workshops, tours related to landscape and gardening. Um, we encourage uh, everyone to visit the FRED specific site, which is uh, FRED2013.com for more information and to register for classes. 
Um, and lastly, um, Olmstead Society will have a booth at the uh, car show later this month, at the end of the month on the 29th. Uh, look forward to seeing you there. And in closing, uh, I encourage all of you to, uh, to visit our website, olmsteadsociety.org, to learn more about the society as well as uh, join the society if you'd like. Thank you for your time. Yes, Joe. Can I ask you a question? Could you explain what the, um, the box is in front of the village hall? Right. Um, thank you for asking. Uh, as part of uh, FRED, there is a, a competition that's been uh, created called Beyond the Rain Barrel. Uh, rain barrels have become very popular in harvesting uh, rainfall for, for gardening purposes, and uh, the idea is to try and come up with ideas for rain barrels that don't look like barrels, that they could be incorporated into your landscape or part of your architecture of your building. And what was uh, created out in front is a, a rain barrel that looks like a bench, but it has the added feature of also uh, providing some light. I think it's, uh, it's a solar powered um, uh, light source in, in the base of that unit. So it provides some ambient lighting as well. So, it's something to try and encourage people to think a little differently about uh, rain barrels, and uh, and maybe more people will make use of them as well. Thanks for asking. Thank you, Gant. Thank you to Floss for all the work you do, and we and the village greatly appreciates the donations that you make of the and the plants for for our landscape. Happy to do it. Thank you very much, Mr. Gallagher. He's always quick, and then we'll give you some time. He's always quick. Scalios, 3234, <laughs> South Harlem. Good evening, Mr. President, trustees, those in attendance, and to those watching at home. Sir, I come before you in the Village Board on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce. It is my pleasure to inform the public of the upcoming Chamber events. Um, as again mentioned, the uh, Chamber will be hosting its annual car show on Sunday, September 29th. It'll be from 8 to 5 p.m. Uh, last year, we had well over 350 cars vintage, muscle car, et cetera. Uh, and this year, we'll not only have that for the fanfare, but we'll also be having music contests. We'll be selling t-shirts, um, chamber bags, raffle tickets, uh, baskets uh, for car maintenance. Um, so we, of course, encourage people to come out and enjoy um, our annual car show. It will also be televised as well. Um, on behalf of the chamber, as well as the Alliance Club, I want to thank all those who came out and attended the Person of the Year dinner we had last week in honor of Ruth Viark. Um, I also want to thank the Art Center for all of the um, <clears throat> music and entertainment that they provided during that to make it more eventful dinner for everyone to enjoy. And that's all I have for today, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. My name is uh, Fred Cruzel. I live at 114 Lawton, and I'm here um, representing the uh, Riverside and North Riverside Covenant of Churches just to uh, provide a little information that we are next month on October 19th going to be hosting our second, hopefully annual, um, Feed Our Community Day. Uh, some of you may have participated last year when it was held here at the uh, uh, Auditorium. Uh, this year is going to be in North Riverside at at uh, at their facility, um, and I have some. If you wouldn't mind, um, be interested. I have the brochure that really describes it. Um, as I said, I'm here basically just to inform you about it, and hopefully have all of you speak to all of your friends and neighbors to to participate. Uh, last year, they packaged over 45,000 meals. And the meals are actually a, a uh, macaroni and cheese with like a, a nutritious additive. The overall program, at least in the, uh, the Illinois Chicago area, is under the title of Feed Six. And the name comes from, which I didn't realize until just recently, one of these packets, which is not very big, feeds six people. Um, and it does provide you know, a very nutritious meal. Um, last year, they packaged over 45,000 meals and could have packaged a lot more because they had to cut off all the uh, volunteers because that was all the money they had to, uh, um, uh, to do that. Um, this year, they're hoping to package 100,000 meals, and the cost is a quarter a meal. So we're going to be trying to raise $25,000 total. 
uh, from the, the various churches that are part of the Riverside and North Riverside Covenant of Churches, or I should say, not actually the individual churches, but from the, uh, the covenant itself, there's been a pledge of $7,125 already. So, um, you know, we're hoping to raise more from uh, private donations and, and we will be soliciting businesses in, in both communities as well as the people who volunteer are also asked to, uh, to, to pay. It's, it's one of those unusual things where you pay to volunteer. Um, but it does cover the, the cost of the food and as I said, they're, they're hoping to, to raise um, or package twice as many meals as, as they did last year. And I, I know I was doing that and it was actually a lot of fun and, and as I said, they, they cut everybody off because everybody wanted to keep going, but it's like, well, we don't have any meals for the last group that's coming in to package it. So, um, so I just, as I said, I just wanted to, to provide information to you and hopefully you'll talk to all your friends and neighbors. There's a, an online uh, registration um, website that's on the, on the flyer that I handed out, but there's also um, at least two representatives from each of the, the churches. Um, so there will, I'm sure you'll be hearing, you know, in your uh, individual churches as well as trying to get uh, more posters around the businesses and that sort of thing. So if you have any questions, I could I try to answer. <laughs> I would just like to make a comment. One of Please. my other hats is, is the treasurer of the Riverside, North Riverside Covenant of Churches. This was a fabulous event last year and I encourage everyone to come out for it. Uh, as you mentioned, People were so excited, so pumped up, and working in teams to package these meals that we had to hold people back because we wouldn't have had enough supplies to last the full day for the shifts of people that signed up. We had groups of Boy Scouts, groups of brownies, you know, we had all kinds of kids groups working. It was such a convivial atmosphere. And you might think 47,000 meals, 47,000 bags of meals, so that's that would feed 47,000 times six, okay? Where would that go? It went to local food right. pantries, and lest you think, it's sitting on a shelf somewhere. It was distributed within two weeks. So there's a huge need for this in our community and around our community, and it's a great event. So you'll be seeing more about it, and I, I really urge everyone to participate. Thank you. Thank you. So if, if mm -hmm. folks go to the feed6.org site, can they can they find their way then to the air place where they can register and donate? Yes. In they theory, can. yes. I haven't checked it out yet because I just got they just put these together and I haven't actually looked at it. But that should take you, I believe, because it does it, you know it just says feed our community day registration. That I'm guessing it'll probably then that you may have to click on the specific uh, community. I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, it looks to me like it would be their general registration site. Um, and as I said, I didn't get a chance to check that out. So, um, so I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to read this for folks at home who might want to write this down. It's, it's kind of long, but I'll go slow here. It's www.feed6, the numeral six, dot org, backslash feed, hyphen our hyphen community hyphen day hyphen registration dot html uh, and if you just want a shorter one to go to and try to find your way to it that would be www.feed6.org and then this also does have the two local uh, contacts uh, uh, Janine Buttermer and, and uh, Jim O'Toole um, and as I said I'm sure you'll be seeing more flyers around and, and hearing from it from other organizations and churches and that sort of thing. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Other comment, Mr. Butter? That website does work. The just but the feed yes, feed six dot org. It will take you to the page. Okay, great. It's right there Excellent. for our for our event. Excellent. Hi, I'm. I'm Jerry Buttermer, I live at 270 Scottswood, and I'm here to report on the missing link. That's the path behind the building which completes the one mile loop. Frederick Law Olmsted provided our guiding vision for this task. 
And in fact, 145 years ago this week, Olmsted reported to his investors, and I quote, a public drive and walk should be carried near the edge of a bank in such a way as to avoid destroying the more valuable trees growing upon it. And there should be pretty boat landings, terraces, balconies overhanging the water, and pavilions at points desirable for observing regattas, mainly of rustic character, and to be half overgrown with vines. Now please hold that vision, because it's more inspiring than looking at the current phase of our demolition work, which by the way included vines, but mostly poison ivy vines. During your board meetings in July and August, we discussed the restoration of the missing link to complete a one mile loop using Swan Pond, the bridges, and the forest on the far bank. Three things were involved. Number one, we promised to cut a natural path through a 400 foot stretch of thicket behind these buildings. Number two, we said we would open up incredible sight lines. And number three, we committed to make that area safe and attractive. You voted unanimously to grant permission, and the staff provided support. We, we thank you. And Mike Collins was on time. He, 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 followed, uh, he followed the Olmsted Society from Riverbank Road on their project in the morning. He was there at noon. Ours was cleaned up, and he was out of there by 1.30. I'm reporting back and seeking your continued approval to move forward. Number one, the path is cut. Number two, to open the sight lines, we propose reducing the weed trees on the lower bank by eliminating invasive plants and those under four inches in diameter, similar to what the Olmsted Society is doing on Riverside Road. And number three, to enhance safety, we propose immediately installing a temporary safety fence the entire length of the retaining wall. A few adjustments such as stump removal and gentle grading will help reduce trip hazards and ease transitions along the path. I attached a couple of photos. Uh, you can now stand at one end of the path by the library below the bay window and you can see the tower of the suspension bridge on the other end and vice versa. From inside the library, if you look through this window, you can see what's beautiful, it's a wall of green trees. But our suggestion is that that wall of trees is on this side of the river and a longer view could be pretty fascinating where you'd look across the water to a forest on the far side of the river. So thus far it's gone extremely well and I'll be happy to take any of your questions or comments. I, I was actually back there today and it's extraordinary the amount of work that you, that you accomplished back there. You really opened it up. Um, and our village manager can probably speak to this, but my understanding is, is that our, our engineer, the village engineer, mm -hmm. is going to be out there tomorrow to do a safety evaluation and, and, and look at the possibility of, of grading uh, is, is one of the things that you suggest in here. Mm -hmm. So that I think that's probably the next step is for us to get the Good. engineering report back and then, we, and then we, can, uh, we can consider it and move forward from there. And, and when I say grading, I'm not talking about anything substantial. There's, there's three areas where it's very light. Right. Uh, no cutting, adding a little bit, moving, moving one area around a little bit. Did anyone else, has anybody else been back there to look at it? Did you want to say anything? Yeah, Mike? I, I worked back there a day with Jerry, and um, I, I think that it has just so many possibilities. Um, if we can get a piece of equipment in there to remove some of the stumps that are in there, uh, do some light grading, <clears throat> that retaining wall is more uh, substantial than I thought, having exposed all of it. Um, you know, and again, to Jerry's point, if we can start clearing some of the undergrowth below that wall uh, and create pockets of trees, uh, much like the Olmsted people are proposing, then I think it will open up some vistas and some sight lines to the water so you'll actually be able to see the river. Um, but w we removed a lot of material out of there. Um, it was amazing to see how much growth was in there. What about the temporary fence? Um, is that something that you're looking at doing sooner rather than later? Because it is a, somewhat of a steep grade from the, uh, from the parking lot. Um, yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, there, there's kind of, 
let me describe it as three sections. Coming from Swan Pond, the goal is to get to the Swinging Bridge. The first section by the library is about 150 feet. Tom Lupfer from Lupfer Landscaping has been doing their work for some time now. It's in pretty good shape. There are a couple of shrubs that need to be removed. We've left them just to kind of hide what we're doing. Not that we don't want anyone to know, we just don't want to draw a crowd. Uh, that area is in pretty good shape. When you get to the top of what I now call Library Hill is the municipal parking lot. That's about 85 feet wide. And as you get behind the parking lot, the pitch to the river is steep. Now we believe that we can use only the top six feet. And this would take some adjustment later on, depending on where you want to go with, with the whole concept. But meanwhile, people can actually walk through the parking lot if they wanted to. And then the main chunk, which is really the view of the river, is behind the town hall or the youth center. That's almost 300 feet long. I think the area behind the municipal lot and the youth center should have a temporary fence. It's not 10 feet drop, but it's probably five. I think National Park Standards usually recommend it at around four. So I think we should put something up as, as soon as you give us permission, the guys would do it. I would envision right now a construction fence. That way the board, the plan commission, the LAC, or whomever wants to have input can talk about more of a permanent fence. I had recommended like black chain link, 42 inches. But I don't want to rush to put that in if there should be more deliberation. And yet, even though we have the ends locked off, we're going to draw curiosity seekers at some point, and I think it ought to be protected. We'll put it in. First thought that comes to my mind is using the fences that we use around Guthrie Park to keep the kids out of the street. The fence posts that the, villages, the village uses are substantial. We'll, you know, we'll sink them, so put the, put the screening on the inside, tie it off <coughs> properly. I guess my, my, my suggestion would be to hold off on, on moving forward with the project until the village engineer has an opportunity to, to go back there and evaluate it and let us know what safety precautions we will definitely need to take and as well as probably hopefully give us rough estimates as far as um, possible costs. Do you, do you have anybody working with you right now uh, from FLOSS? Does anybody help? Are any of the volunteers you have? Plus. Part of our group, I'm sure we probably have some members, but we don't, we don't have, I'm going to meet with the library board next week to begin to reach out to them and make sure they're on board. I've thought that we probably ought to do the same with the Olmstead board. Because uh, it seems to me going forward, I mean, you know, I mean, you were talking about the shrubbery behind the library, I, you know, I was looking at that today, the, you know, some of those shrubs are actually very nice. So, and especially if you're talking about on that lower level, starting to try to thin some of that out. That, that would be something that would need to be done, I think, with, with some aesthetic oversight. You know, I mean, there, there should be some kind of vision of, of what you want that area to look like. And, and FLOSS, I think, and LAC would be the natural places to get that kind of expertise. I know that you have Tom Luck for helping you, who is highly skilled, but it, um, I mean, it is public village property. It'd be nice to make sure, I mean, it's extraordinary what's going on. I just, I just want to make sure we get it right, you know, because you can't regrow them once we cut them, you know. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I would like to keep going while we have weather, while we have low water, okay. in addressing the lower riverbank to create some of the, the windows. Right now what's growing out of the lower riverbank are mostly 30-foot tall spindly trees because they don't have enough sunlight. and. Right. And they're all, and they're all, they're all, weeds. they're all weeds and volunteers. Okay. Well, let's see what the, let's see what the uh, engineer says, engineer says tomorrow, and Peter can can be in touch with you and give you, or you could, you're welcome to come out and, and join them when they when they walk through it. If you want to do that. Since since we've done some of the study with Jim Anderson from Anderson Construction and Tom in terms of the general grading that we have in mind, I'd be happy to be there and. and Ten o'clock. I'm sorry. Ten o'clock tomorrow morning. Ten o'clock. Okay. Okay. So let's take let's let's get that done and then we'll then we'll keep pushing. Sounds great. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much here for all your work.
Any other comment? Uh, before we move on to the balance of our agenda, I, I wanted to take just a, a solemn moment. Uh, and I've asked Trustee Ballerine to, to talk a little bit more about this, but uh, we recently lost a very, very special member of our community, uh, Ellen Herda, who was as much a family to this community as anyone that you could ever imagine. And so I asked uh, Trustee Ballerine, who has a long history with her, to please take a moment to talk a little bit about Ellen. Um, Ellen Herta um, was a dedicated ed educator and Parks and Rec Board member passed away last week after a prolonged il illness. Um, and she will always be remembered for her countless hours she, get it, she dedicated to the Park and Recreation Department. Um, many people don't know, but Ellen was in um, complete retirement when the uh, Rec Department um, went through some transitions and we had to go out and find a new Rec Director. And we, we spent quite a while trying to do it, and, and the department was, was a, you know, was a full-fledged department, and we needed somebody to run it. And, and Ellen came out of retirement for free to run our rec department for almost six months. Um, and she was on the board for as long as, as I can remember. Um, she was a, an elder statesman when I first got on the board, and that was back in 99 or 2000, uh, and she was on it most of the time. Um, so she passed away last week, and, and um, she would be rem remembered by the Recreation Department, by our residents that she came in contact with, um, by all our fellow board members, and I'm sure all the students that uh, she taught all along the way. Um, and a lot of people have asked over the, the last couple of weeks is, you know, what, what is, what's the arrangements, blah, blah, blah. Well, 9.14, um, 10 o'clock a.m., there will be a memorial service for her at the uh, St. Mary's Church. She will be sorely missed. She was an extraordinary woman, um, inspirational, kind, decent, everything you could ever say about somebody. So she will be very much missed. Next up are the reports of village officers. I just have a, a couple quick things. Uh, first, I would like to extend a thank you to Riverside Township. Uh, they were very gracious in, in giving the village a grant that allowed us to purchase a speed calming sign that is uh, now in place over on Berry Point Road, and we greatly appreciate that. Uh, an update on the application for our grant for the Burlington Streetscape. Uh, the application has been filed. We have, to date, we have re received letters of support from uh, both of our state senators, Senators uh, Landeck and Sandoval. All of our representatives, representatives uh, Representative Hernandez, Tavares, and Zaleski. We also were able to get letters of support from Congressman Gutierrez and Congressman Lipinski. And we have had very positive feedback, although we haven't secured the letters yet, from uh, Senators Durbin and Kirk. So that process is moving along well. And uh, we, ha we have learned a little bit more about how the process works. Uh, in the first instance, uh, it will go out to a team of reviewers who will score the grant application. Uh, these reviewers are unknown to us uh, so that they can work in, in private. Uh, once it is scored, it will go to a review committee, and if that review committee passes it on, it would then go to IDOT and to Governor Quinn. So we're guardedly optimistic. We have a lot of great support from our representatives and our senators that we greatly appreciate, and we will keep pushing forward to try to make that happen. And that's all I have for this evening. Mr. Scalera. Okay. I will be brief. I only have three items for my report. The first is to notify the community that our code enforcement officer has begun her um, village-wide inspection. And any homes um, that are in violation of any of our ordinances will receive a door hanger um, notifying them of the violation and the time frame that they have to um, rectify the um, the uh, violation. Um, I wanted to alert the board and the community that um, the village has been working with Morton Arboretum to run a chemical research trial regarding um, protection of the emerald from the emerald ash borer for both our green and blue ash in Riverside. And um, as a result of the trial, 
I'm, I'm sad to report that um, we do have approximately 30 ash trees in the Indian Garden area that have not um, reacted positively to the chemicals um, trial. And so we will be forced to remove those ash trees and that work is scheduled to take place on Tuesday, September 10th. So Indian Gardens will be closed to um, patrons. And finally, I wanted to just acknowledge the hard work of Chief Kimura and his staff um, who recently were notified that the village fire protection rating um, will be maintained at a number three. And this is a rating system that goes from one to 10, 10 being the worst, one being the best. So this is important because the ISO rating is a primary factor used by the insurance industry to develop insurance premiums for residential and commercial businesses. So congratulations to uh, Chief Kamora and his staff on the hard work that they did in regards to that. And that is all I have. Thank you very much. Next up is the approval of the consent agenda. Uh, it's my understanding from our village attorneys that there is one item that needs some clarification with regard to the contract with Burke. Is Correct. That uh, on item L, we have reviewed that contract as requested and we're ba fundamentally all right with it, but want to go back to them and suggest a couple of changes. So what we would suggest is changing this approval to being subject to attorney approval and we'll attempt to get that resolved. Any problem with that? Should anyone? that be pulled up the consent agenda? Then? No, it, would, we it's, do? it will be added as subject to attorney approval. If everyone's okay with it, stated that way. Okay. Right. Okay. Other than that, uh, you can see what's what's here: a number of commission minutes, a few contracts, and does anyone require, request anything to be removed from the consent agenda? Hearing none, I ask for a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. I move to approve. Motion by Ms. Collins. Second. Second by Ms. Hamilton. Please call the roll. Trustee Pollock. Yes. Trustee Hamilton. Yes. Trustee Ballard. Aye. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Foley. No. I object to item one. Consent series. Consent agenda does pass with a vote of four to one. We have no reports of departments and commissions, so we'll move on to ordinances and resolution. First up is a first reading of an ordinance amending various sections of the Village of Riverside Zoning Ordinance and Village Code relative to special and permitted uses in various zoning districts, uh, including regulation of bed and breakfast establishment and rental kiosk. Peter, did you want to handle this or do you want uh, Mike to do if it? Michael can. Attorney Mars, would you like to present this? Uh, as you recall, the plan commission uh, was charged by the board with looking at uh, some, some of the use designations in the business districts and, and elsewhere uh, it, with an eye towards seeing whether uh, some of them could be converted to permitted uses um, in, in creating a more business friendly environment. Uh, the plan commission made some recommendations and the board then authorized a public hearing on that. Uh, we held the public hearing um, a couple of weeks ago, and those recommendations uh, were made uh, pretty much as they were presented uh, to you in their initial report. Uh, we've now put it down into ordinance form, uh, and and uh, that's before you today. Uh, so there's several areas uh, where we're looking at um, turning current uh, special uses into permitted uses, including um, brew pubs and craft distilleries where we have some, some liquor regulations already in place. Uh, those are also regulated by the state. Restaurants with outdoor cafes, so, so those who desire to, as so long as they're complying with the village uh, regulations and, on outdoor cafes, don't have to go and get a special use and, and pay the extra thousand dollars for that. Um, Retail sales establishments in, in a couple of the zones where they were currently listed as special uses are, are proposed to be changed to permitted. Um, art galleries and then bed and breakfast uh, establishments are something that were allowed uh, as special uses in a couple of the residential zoning districts, um, but we've created a set of fairly extensive uh, regulations for bed and breakfast that are going to be 
inserted into the village code under the business regulation section. And uh, so long as a bed and breakfast establishment is able to comply with those, they can then uh, be a permitted use. And the last was a, a tavern and lounge. And I had one uh, point that I noted, I think, in the agenda history sheet on that. Uh, that was a special use. It was proposed to become a permitted use in the retail core. Uh, but in conducting this review, we noticed that the liquor code in the village code doesn't actually have a uh, classification for standalone liquor serving establishments. They all have to be, uh, ha have to have a food menu that goes along with them. So um, I, I think at some point the board should consider whether it's interested in keeping a classification like that. And if it's not, we should simply strike Tavern Lounge from the, uh, from the uses that are under the under the uh, zoning ordinance since since you can't really do it um, and I think that was pretty that pretty much captures oh the last thing was uh, creator creation of rental uh, rental kiosks as temporary uses on uh, public property um, and that that goes along with the CMAP recommendations so that we have the ability uh, on our public property to license uh, people to have bike rental facilities, possibly canoes, kayaks, that sort of thing, um, on a temporary basis, uh, subject to a license agreement with the village. So this is the first reading. Uh, any trustees have any? I have one question. With the bed and breakfast, yes. uh, it seems like uh, most of the houses that would be actively sought for a bread and basket would be kind of the older, more, OK. And many of them have um, coach houses. We don't allow um, uh, occupancy of a coach house, am I correct? If they date, I think that's right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I, if didn't, look at, I didn't look at then. the coach houses in conjunction with this, so I, I, I can't really say off the top of my head. I do have the zoning ordinance with me. I could. I'm just wondering if, you know, if there's, if they have to be a landmark home. I'm just wondering if a home that's not a landmark home has a, an inhabitable coach house, that would be if I was a bed and breakfast owner. Sure. I would live in the coach house and rent out my home. Okay. Um, so I, that's probably something that we might want to think about um, because that it would also add several more rooms to a type of bed and breakfast. Right. So if the thought is if the board's amenable to, to allowing occupancy of a coach house in a uh, non historic home uh, as part of a bed and breakfast, I can look at that and uh, put something in for second reading. Does anybody? That makes sense. Sure. Anybody else? This, this is wonderful work. You know, congratulations to you and, and to the Planning Commission for doing this. I, I couldn't be happier, happier with, uh, Thank you. With, the, yeah, with the product here. Uh, it's going to, yes, Mr. Pollock? Uh, a couple he of thinks, things. He thinks so, too. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I, I, I am in complete agreement. I'm glad to see this come forward. and. I attended the Planning Commission meeting and they deliberated on this and they did a good job of, of looking at uh, looking at this from different perspectives and and I value their their recommendation. Um, just uh, a couple of things. One is um, I'm, I'm leaning toward uh, agreeing or, or suggesting that that maybe taverns that don't serve food should remain as special uses. I think that may be a concern. And I think the Planning Commission kind of left that open for us to, to look at. Um, then also, kind of separately, but in conjunction with this, uh, the attorney had mentioned the possibility of amending our liquor code. Uh, right now, as I understand it, the liquor code says that a liquor license can be revoked for any violation of the liquor code. And it was suggested that maybe we expand that to say that a liquor license could be revoked for any violation of village code, period. And I think that would give us, if we ever had a problem with an establishment, we'd have more authority through the liquor license to, to do that. So uh, ideally, I'd, if everyone's in agreement, I'd like to see that on, on our agenda, on an upcoming agenda for consideration. It's a way of giving the control you had with the special use to exactly. sort of yeah exactly plug it in. yeah that was um, the idea and actually I think it's 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 a better it's a more appropriate mechanism for regulating liquor establishments than the zoning uh, would be in this case um, 
then the third thing that just, and, and I apologize for, for, for bringing this up at the last minute, but it just in re-reviewing this before the meeting, I, I, I'm not sure if I read this right, was the recommendation from the Planning Commission that bed and breakfasts be permitted uses in all residential districts? Or was it limited to certain districts only? Um, it was presented to them as, as, as all permitted in all residential districts, and, and it, you know, I don't think they made any changes to that. Uh, you know, certainly if, if, if uh, the board deems it appropriate, to, to have it remain I, I such I a use as the board for what their thoughts on that. Um, if someone proposed a bed and breakfast next door to you, do you think that should be a public hearing or should that be as of right? I guess it's a loaded question. You could tell kind of what I'm thinking. They have put in quite a few regulations so that it would be limited as to what, you know, the amount of space that's required Certainly. in that. So I don't think it would be if it's in a smaller residential area where the houses are smaller, I don't think that the regulations are going to allow a lot of people to be staying in that home. Would you agree with that? It's kind of, it almost limits itself by the regulations that are there. Yeah, that was the, that's the concept. Right. right. And it's the same with the liquor code issue too. You try to put in the equivalent control, but not right. requiring all the public hearing. Right. So as long as it meets the regulations, I don't have a problem with it being. The other perspective on that too, though, is if we're going to open up our market, so to speak, for a bed and breakfast, perhaps we should consider limiting those, the location of that close to downtown. There's only going to be room for one, maybe two bed and breakfasts in this whole town. If someone captures that market by locating on uh, you know, Addison Road or wherever, Olmstead Road, that's going to take away, you know, now, okay, now someone's gotten the market and we're not going to get one in the downtown. Uh, one of the things you do through zoning is direct appropriate businesses where you want them to be. And so I guess my thinking is to perhaps limit the bed and breakfasts to the downtown commercial districts, the peripheral districts, and then I think it's, is it an R3 that's on uh, um, Pine Street, that area, uh, kind of a higher density residential district? I think if we have a bed and breakfast, that's where we want it. We don't want it on Olmstead Road. We don't want it uh, on Scottswood, um, necessarily. I, I'm just Again, this is just something that, that occurred to me kind of at the last minute, so I'm really throwing it out there more for discussion's sake. When I think of a bed and breakfast, I think of one like one of the houses on Scottswood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I would think of. Or not all. Yeah. Or Michelle. One yeah. of those big old houses. Okay. I mean, yeah. those would, those. Those are the ones that would attract people. Yeah. And generally with a town that's only 1.5 miles square, you know, most of the houses are within, I'd say, half a mile of the, of right. the downtown. That's a good point. I, Again, I just bring that up for discussion's sake. Um, but then again, going back to that first perspective, I still am a little bit hesitant to say it's a, it's a permitted use anywhere in town. I'm still not sure that I'm completely comfortable with that. I mean, if the rest of the board is comfortable with that, that's okay with me. I, I don't feel that. I mean, we do have appropriate regulations, but I could just see a resident you know, residents having concern, even if they're completely complying with every aspect of those regulations in terms of parking and density and you know everything else, um, is that something that a resident should be able to weigh in on and say, uh, you know, I have these concerns. I want to be heard before this business is is allowed to open in this location, because it is a business in a residential district. Um, but wasn't that the reason we, there was a public hearing? Yeah, right, and that's why we're talking about it tonight. But it was also as talked a text about as a, yeah, right, as a, yeah, right, right. I mean, it, if you believe it should be limited, I would like to hear what your limitations would be. Well, I believe that 
it, it, the, the, the limitations that are in there are appropriate and are fine. But I just no, I'm think about the geographic limitations. The geographic limitations, if someone wants to open up a commercial business on my block, I think my neighbors and I should have the right to, to have a public hearing and have, have that have the particular business show that they can fit into the neighborhood without unduly impacting the neighborhood. Well, isn't that what they have to do through all the regulations that we they have to jump through in order to put the business up? I mean, then 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 yeah. then then, then we'll, we then we might as well not even have bed and breakfast. That's right. Because then then you got pine that they, they you know someone on pine doesn't want one, someone on Michelle doesn't want one, someone on Nuttall doesn't want one, someone on Olmsted. Then then you then you just. I, you know, I think the, the way to craft it is to try to regulate it to, to a certain point. Because uh, basically, I don't think anyone would want to live next to a bed and breakfast because they've never lived next to a bed and breakfast before. And then, you know, until it is established and up and running to find out that it, it, either, it, either, it either is or it is not a nuisance. Um, and if it is not a nuisance, then the, then the problem goes away. If it is a nuisance, then it gets caught in the regulations, and then we t then we as a village need to take action. I, I agree with what you're saying. I just don't I don't see how you how you do that through the whole village, without negatively impacting one place or another. Um, if we're going to do it, we need to we need to do it. I think for the whole. Well, I, I think it, they should be they absolutely should be permitted uses in the central area of town. Um, and uh, because you you know if you you expect that type of use in the central area of town, it's just you don't expect to you know when you have a residential home, you don't expect to have a commercial business next door to you. I mean, that is a dramatic change in zoning I philosophy. Disagree. So what do you what do you what do you what do you recommend that it only be a B B B B one B two? I, I don't have the the, the definitely the B one B two, uh, all the business districts. Also the um, and I, I, I'm sorry I don't have the zoning map in front of me, but the the I think it, is it R three that is a jet that's uh, by on uh, the north side of the tracks, behind Riverside Garage. Right, like the Pine area is, right. is R three, yeah. Make it a permitted use there because that's a high density residential area. But in other locations, I feel like it's a commercial business in a residential neighborhood, and that is a, a significant change in, in, in zoning. I guess I have two thoughts. One, I mean, technically, you are correct that it's a commercial business. But it's a bed and breakfast. I mean, it isn't a grocery store. It isn't a hardware store. Right. It's it's a different kind of business. And two, with regard to the the proximity to the train station or downtown, it seems to me that that is something that the market would take care of. I mean, if someone decided to open a bed and breakfast on the periphery of our town, and then somebody else opened a bed and breakfast on Scottswood, uh, I suspect that. Before long, only we would only have one bed and breakfast left. So it seems to me that the market forces would probably handle that part of it. But this is, a, I mean, this is a first reading. These are exactly the kind of things that we should be talking about. And I also think we should circle circle back to what Attorney Mars asked and what what Trustee Pollock raised is you know this question about the standalone taverns uh, that don't serve serve food. Do we do, is that something that we want to make a permitted use? Um, and then I would like to kind of close the loop on, I think, your suggestion about the liquor license, you know, that we would be, have the right to revoke it for a violation of any aspect of our code is a good one. Uh, and if the trustees feel that we, you know, we should, I think we should try to go ahead and wrap that into, into this process now. Let's go ahead and get that in place so we have as many protections in place as possible. So, uh, so I guess two things going forward. What about... You know, what about the location 
of the bed and breakfast? Do we want to let market forces rule, or do you want to try to find some way to delineate it? And two, what do you think about standalone taverns? For the bed and breakfast, I do see it as different than most commercial properties. Um, I don't think it's people coming and going a lot because, like I said, it's limited by the regulations that, as to how many rooms you can have. And so I just don't think it's going to be a lot of people that are going to be upsetting the neighborhood. And if it is, like Joe said, if it becomes a nuisance, then we need to deal with that and, and figure out how to regulate it. Um, so I would be more inclined to let it be open at this point, and then if we need to do something down the road, then we would do that. That's my personal opinion. Stand alone taverns? No. Since you got the microphone. I don't think we should have stand alone taverns. I don't think a stand alone tavern could could make it without selling food or, <laughs> or or you know video poker or whatever and we don't allow video poker so I, so would we like to leave that as a special use then i, I would like i would leave it yeah, yeah. yeah. You, might, you might actually even just could you it's a, it's a special use now but there's no liquor license for it so it's so you say we could just eliminate right it. I, I think yeah, you just, just strike it from your cut from yeah because because okay. in effect it's you can't do it now anyway because you don't you see what i mean yeah, so, so you do we clean it up so whatever you decide we should clean it up and just mm -hmm. eliminate so are we in agreement all right. around the board okay all right so are we done with our first reading of this okay great and as i said great work to the bank commission and to you mr mars this is uh this is quite a momentous step forward for our village and uh, a direct implementation of the CMAP priorities that we have set forward to do. So I'm really glad to see this. Next up is uh, our Monty Python-esque moment of <laughs> a first reading of an ordinance that will do away with first readings. <laughs> so this is a... Uh, it, and it just doesn't, it's not any fun to waive the reading without Gene here. <laughs> <laughs> so this like is... Uh, tonight. This is the first reading of an ordinance amending the village code of the village of Riverside, Illinois, relative to approval of ordinances. Uh, and I'll just, I'll just read this so I think we all know what we're talking about already. Uh, Title I, Chapter 6, Section 9 of the village code of the village of Riverside mandates that all ordinances that come before the village board for consideration, quote, be presented at two board meetings before the board of trustees vote on that ordinance. The board of trustees may vote on the ordinance at the second meeting at which the ordinance is presented following this presentation and discussion thereon. The Board of Trustees can waive the second reading of an ordinance by a vote of the concurrence of a majority of all members then holding office, end quote. Uh, after discussing this at our August 15th meeting, the consensus of the board was to direct our village attorney to draft an ordinance that would amend the requirement and in essence eliminate the requirement for two readings. So that is what's before us tonight as a first reading. Is there further discussion on this? Well, I think the, f the, the discussion we had on the zoning changes is, is a great segue to this discussion because that would be the perfect thing that Trustee Sussman spoke about. It's something that the, the, the board wants to, to, to talk about further. It's, it's some major changes and it gives an opportunity for residents to, to speak, and that would be the type of thing that I, I would think that would, wouldn't pass this muster and would come back for a second reading. And then there's many, many things that's just, just a waste of time. Um, so, I, I, of course, I'm in favor of this, um, and I hope we, and I, but I won't, I won't make a motion <laughs> to waive the first reading of <laughs> Further discussion? Okay, we'll have this come back. Uh, well, actually, um, yeah, we'll have, we'll have we'll vote on it. We'll have it come back on the agenda for a second reading next time instead of putting it on the consent agenda, just in case Trustee Sussman is here and wants to vote against it. Uh, next up, we move on to considerations. And first up is a discussion of the Riverside Municipal Code Title III, Business Regulations, Licensing Requirements, Grounds for Suspension, Revocation, Non-Renewal, or Denial. Uh, work or operation of businesses without licenses or permits and other provisions. It's a long-winded way of saying, uh, I ask this to be put on the agenda for discussion tonight. Um, it is, and this is again in keeping with our ongoing efforts to further and strengthen uh, the maintenance standards in, in our village and our construction standards. As, of, as things stand right now, the village manager does have the uh, the power to, to suspend a license after a hearing if someone can, can, uh, actually does work without a, 
permit. Uh, what I would like to talk about tonight among the board is, is strengthening these requirements. Uh, personally, I, and just for my two cents, I would like to see something much more close to a zero tolerance kind of policy here in our village where there is not a contractor, to my knowledge, who does business in this town that does not know that they need a permit to do business. Uh, if they don't get a permit, in my opinion, after a hearing, we should have the authority to suspend their license for some period of time to be determined by the board. Uh, and I think uh, upon multiple violations, we should have a right to revoke their license altogether and ban them from doing business in the village. I also think, think it would be useful to have a public list of approved businesses who are in good standing with business licenses in our community, as well as a list of those who have had licenses uh, suspended or revoked. So that's the context of the, of the conversation, and I welcome the comments of the trustees. Yeah, putting a list up of people that have been revoked or suspended doesn't make me feel really like that's, you know, there is some risk in that because you, you run the risk of a sort of defamation type of, to the business or a thing like that. On the other hand, you know, truth is always a defense and if it was absolutely accurate, but it does, you run some confrontational risks. I think having a list of contractors, a simple list, as long as staff know they can't steer anybody anyways, people often will say, well, what does the village think? Who are the ones that you can't do that? And sometimes by having a list, you sort of invite more questions to try to press who was better. Uh, but to simply have a list of people who have licenses. The one problem with having such a list is it has to be clear that it's not an exclusive list. These are just the people that currently have taken the trouble and anyone, if they meet the requirements, even if they're not on the list, as long as they follow the rules and get a license, can, can, can do business. So we'd have to make that clear as well. So I guess I'm, I'm more okay with having the list of people that currently have license if it's clear that it's not exclusive in any way. Uh, and I, I think I would recommend against sort of the, the other kind of of list because it, I don't, I don't know that it would be, you know, often this comes up with uh, contractors, it could come up in bidding, where contractors have a problem on a job that they won, and then the second time around when they bid on work, uh, they're not selected because they're not deemed to be the, the, the lowest responsible bidder. And uh, oftentimes, you know, businesses, when that, when that happens and they lose a job, they, they can change their culture. And sometimes they'll come back and they'll ask for a meeting. I just like to say, I'd like to put in again and I'd like to be considered. We hear what you had to say. And uh, sometimes that can change. And so I think with the list, you know, I just think it probably I wouldn't recommend it. And the, 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 the thing that, that, that worries me, not worry me, but, but bothers me, and I agree with what you're, what you're doing in concept is, if I'm a contractor and I come into the village and I work without a permit, I, as you say, every contractor knows they should have a permit. So right from the beginning, I'm not exactly the best contractor in the world. Um, so unless you, and, and then to, to say, well, if you don't come and get a permit or if you don't come and get a business license, you can't have a license in the village. Well, it doesn't matter to me. I don't get them and get a permit anyway. So you just keep the, it just, people that have bad habits like that will keep perpetuating the bad habit. Unless we, unless you can do what you're saying and that's putting a list that says these are bad contractors or instead of not allowing them to work in the town, find them. Well, that, you mean that, that's what you, you find them, you know, you're, they're do. caught doing work in town. You find them $250. And, they're and fought the second time. You find them $500 and you, you find the resident, yeah. you know, you go to the resident and the resident then has the, the probably at that point in time still owes the contractor. And uh, I think that's almost, that's at least a way that we could make somebody know that they're, they're they've done something. 
they're going to get in trouble for doing it wrong. But bad behavior is generally instilled in people that behave badly. There's, there, there's often. Go ahead. No, I, I just had a question about the fine. Um, I mean, under under our existing code right now, the village manager has the has the authority to suspend the license. The village manager can't have the authority to to assess a fine without right. some kind of formal adjudication, right? Well, yes and no. What you can do, what, what sometimes happens is you have to provide some sort of a hearing, but often what, what will be set up is a kind of procedure where the village manager could be given the authority to establish a fine subject to a request for a hearing. So for example, up to a certain amount. So the village manager, if there was a violation based on you know, a single time or whatever, you could say subject to a fine or suspension, but then you put in the notice imposing it that it's subject that, it, that a request for a hearing needs to be made within so many days, you know, often 20 or something like that in, in writing. And then automatically the matter that if a request is made is set over for hearing. And since you have an ALJ procedure, you, that's where I would recommend it would go. And the hearing can then you, can you Spell out ALJ. Administrative law judge. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. And you, you have that procedure in house to deal with your parking and with your uh, vehicle stickers and things like that. And so it would go before that individual for a hearing. Yeah. Now, now right now, if we have problems with, with building or zoning or building, then those don't go to the ALJ at this point. They go to Maple Right. 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 But you're currently. Eventually, that's going to. My and understanding that, is we're, Peter we're, would like that to go over there. Right. So we're, we're working on that. We're working on right that. Now. And, yeah. and, and that that change from having to go to Maybrook instead instead of, and having to come to an ALJ here, that is something that we have the authority to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. So so that could be tied in, yeah. in, in with this. But yeah. I'd, I'd like to hear what other folks think about this concept. Uh, I, I think to get compliance. contractor and working in a lot of other communities and, and and maybe to our point we might be understaffed for this um, but working in other communities and knowing what they do to police their job sites for instance in our town right now I can think of two uh, construction projects that are underway where their site is in quite dismay disarray uh, with no fencing and dumpsters it, it, where they shouldn't be, port johns in plain sight. Um, if this was another community, those items would be caught right away. Work would be stopped immediately until the violation is corrected. A violation would be issued that day. Um, I think getting tough weeds out the bad contractors. Um, I think if the bad contractors tend to flock to areas where they think it's easy to do business, where I don't think that they're policed very much. Um, not saying that we, we're like that, um, but I, I, I think to, to get people to fall in line, we have to have enforcement. Um, and I'm saying that as a general contractor in, in the town that I live in. Um, I think it's very important. Um, I think it's very important for public safety, uh, for worker safety, for safety of the job site. Um, I also think it's important that we understand at the, at the rate we're going, we're losing a lot of revenue uh, by not charging some of these fees that we could be to some of these contractors that are coming into our town and performing work. That's my opinion. I agree with Mike. I think that enforcement is key and there hasn't been as much enforcement. I also agree with Joe that um, uh, contractors who have gotten away with it before will continue to try and get away with it. Mm -hmm. But I believe our residents play a part in that as well, because if they think they can get a job done cheaper because they're getting it done by someone who's not getting a permit and not licensed, a lot of people will do that. And I think it's a matter of educating our residents as well. And the best way to educate anyone is through enforcement, mm -hmm. because that stings. I was thinking maybe instead of having the bad list, um, if we did something like, you know, these are blue ribbon people or whatever, they have not had their license suspended, they have met these different criteria or whatever, 
um, would that be a way of kind of? So I think that's probably what we can't do because we can't give the we, we can't you can't give that. We don't want to rank right. it. No, but I have I have to say with all due respect to to our village attorney, I mean the list that's most important is the list of people that had their licenses suspended or revoked. Th those are exactly the people that the, we want our residents to know about. The, the contractors that, that constantly violate uh, code violations, building violations, that bounce checks to us, that um, uh, are disrespectful to our employees, to our inspectors who show up on their job site. Those are the kind of contractors that I don't want to see working in this town. Um, and we do have the right to, I think, uh, revoke their license um, to a point. Um, I know in some towns, if this occurs, um, you kind of have to take a time out for a year or so before you're allowed to come back and, and do business in town. And, and that's fine. Yeah. <clears throat> and I guess if, if you wanted to publish some kind of a list, what I would suggest is almost, instead of saying this is the this is the no problem list, here's the list with, is, would be to say that, you know, for every contractor that appears in the village's system, you simply have the, almost like the way you can look up a, a criminal record, or which is, you know, it's public, court records are public. Here are the, here are the administrative records of the village that relate to contractors and let people look, look them up. That way there's no kind of, imprimatur either way of what the village wants and that simply you say this is a public record and, and you can commit so and we encourage people to check out if they're considering a contractor you may want to look through the records of the of the local adjudication as part of your due diligence and simply leave it at that and if someone wants to take the trouble to do that they can learn all kinds of things and, maybe good or, or bad and in some municipalities it's simple as having a list of licensed uh, currently licensed yeah. contractors of record um, and, and the consumer the resident can go online and if they're looking for an electrician they can just scroll through and see which electricians are currently licensed in the village right. and I think what, what president sells was suggesting is if someone has a license just because it hasn't been revoked but they've had some problems in the past you wanted that to be able for the public to know about that and, and I guess my preference would rather than have a list of people that have had problems. It's like, it seems to me you're, you're, you, you're, you're, you want people to draw something from it and, and what's safer is to simply say, these are public records and we encourage our residents to exercise due diligence in choosing a contractor. So, yes. Is there any difficulty in, in making those records public? I'm just talking about an administrative difficulty in accessing and making those. I mean, you must have to have an employee that is available to assist someone who is interested in that. And, I mean, I was just yeah. gonna make that point. I mean, this, I mean, this, this is just an initial discussion mm -hmm. here. Uh, if, I mean, I agree with, with Trustee Foley that uh, we do not want to be a town that is considered to be an easy mark right. by unscrupulous contractors. Uh, but in order to, in, Having, enforce, having enforcement procedures in place are useless unless we actually have the, the personnel to enforce. Mm -hmm. And so that'll be something that we will have to consider come budget time. Oh, absolutely. Because uh, I, 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 mean, I don't think that we have, currently I don't think we have the personnel in place to do this. Uh, I also suspect it would be at, you know, at, at the very least a zero sum game uh, if we started enforcing these, these kind of things. So uh, maybe the best thing to do is is ha just have staff. I mean, I think there, I hear a consensus that we want that we want to tighten this up and we want enforcement procedures in place. Do you want to start working on something and, and bring something back to us uh, in connection with uh, the personnel requirements it would take to actually do it? Well, I mean, one of the things that we could work on implementing is a construction site plan that the contractor would need to submit with permit application. Absolutely. You know, most municipalities that have a lot of construction activity, of course, can afford it because of the permits <coughs> offset and the cost of hiring that person. But um, usually um, when a site, let's say we're building a home uh, in a particular town, when the, 
when the home is torn down or when the site is broken ground, um, within the first week, uh, the, someone from the village comes to the site to assure that the fence is up, the dumpster's in the proper place, and, and at least getting off the job off to the right start. Uh, and then they're, they're, they're kept a, a w close eye on with a drive-by, and if there are violations, they're, they're fined immediately. All righty, moving forward, next up is a report by Trustee Pollock regarding suggested modifications to the variance procedure, and I, this is something that Trustee Pollock and Trustee Ballerine have been working on uh, at the request of the board, so I will turn it over to you gentlemen to fill us in. Yes, thank you. Um, as stated, Trustee Ballerine and I were asked by President Sells to look into our variation procedures and make sure we were um, doing everything we can to, um, to make the process efficient and uh, make it user friendly for, for our residents who, who may from time to time seek a, a zoning variation. Uh, in response to that, uh, Trustee Ballerine and I met with Community Development Director Bob Carraher and Village Attorney Michael Mars and um, came up with the following uh, recommendations, and you've, uh, the, the Village Board received a written copy of this, so I'll just try to be brief and answer any questions you may have, and Trustee Ballerine can add any comments he has. Uh, it, first and foremost, we uh, asked the Community Development Director to prepare an updated checklist that he can give to an applicant, saying, here's what you need to apply for a variation, and here are the steps involved in the variation, so that anyone who's considering uh, applying for a variation has a one-page summary of the process and a one-page checklist of, of what they need to provide uh, in order to, to file. So there, there's uh, very little question or, or ambiguity about that, and uh, the staff is, is working on that. Uh, in regards to notifications for public hearings in the last variation we have, there was, there were, there was some discussion about uh, certified mailings and different legal proceedings for, for providing notice. Uh, the state law requires a legal notice in a newspaper to be published 15 to 30 days before a hearing. That uh, would be unchanged. We would continue to do that. We have to do that. We don't have any discretion in how that's done. That's, uh, mandated by state law. Um, we currently, the village currently provides <clears throat> a mailing notice to adjacent property owners and by local ordinance, <clears throat> excuse me, that has to be by certified mail or hand delivery. Uh, it was our uh, conclusion that we would uh, recommend changing that to allow that to be done by first class mail. <clears throat> first class mail, which would save uh, money uh, yeah, obviously, first-class mail is a lot cheaper than, than certified mail and uh, also save time for staff as uh, oftentimes they hand deliver the, the mail to the letter, uh, uh, let notice uh, uh, to adjacent property owners. Now, the reason that we're comfortable, the main reason we were comfortable in recommending the first-class mail is the third recommendation for public notices, and that's that a sign be posted on the subject property. Uh, notifying area residents that there's a public hearing scheduled for this meeting. Now, we didn't get into exactly what the content of the sign is. That's something that we would ask staff to, to develop uh, what they feel is appropriate in terms of, of what the sign would say, but at the very least it would say, uh, uh, notice there's a public hearing and a phone number where they can get more information. We talked about putting flyers attached to the sign. Uh, afterwards, I was talking to one of the plan commissioners who suggested a uh, quick read, quick reader code on the sign. Now that may that gets into a whole different things, a <laughs> burden on staff of having to scan and make sure that information is there on the website. But uh, that's something to be looked at. But the main point is just to have a sign on the property so that neighbors see it. And in this town, if you put a real estate sign in your front yard, the neighbors are going to see it. And they'll know that there's a public hearing, so, um, and, and they'll have the opportunity to participate if they want. You know, these notice procedures, uh, it's, I've always described them, it's, it's a belt and sus suspenders approach. You know, one way or another, we're gonna get a notice out to you, whether you see it in the paper, whether you read it uh, 
get, get the letter or you see the sign, you're gonna have an opportunity to participate and that has, by doing all three of those things, you have the least possibility of someone missing the hearing and not being aware of it. Uh, those steps, you know, don't cost a lot of money. The signs are, are relatively cheap. They can be reused uh, over and over again. Uh, we only do a couple of these a year, so it's, it's not a large expense. And speaking of expenses, one of the things that was discussed uh, with the last variation that uh, came before uh, the village board was the fee for a uh, variation. Uh, there seems to be two different philosophies or two different approaches. One approach is to make sure all of our direct costs are covered. If we do that, we're talking at least $1,000 for a variation, probably more. Uh, the sense uh, I, we got from the rest of, the, of our, our uh, trustees was that uh, that was too much of a burden. If someone has a legitimate reason for a variation, they ought to be able to, to file that at a reasonable fee that's not too much of a burden, especially when it's uh, a fence or, or some relatively small project. Uh, the fee that was charged for that last variation, the, the Village Board waived the fee, reduced it to, to $250. Our current fee is $1,000. I think it was a consensus of, uh, of our uh, small group, Trustee Ballery, myself, and uh, was to reduce the fee to $500. Personally, I'm comfortable going down to $250. Um, we don't get that many, but um, so, I mean, the financial impact is not significant but uh, $500 would, would cover more of our costs, obviously. So it's just a matter of where you want to strike that balance between how much of our costs you want to cover, but how much of a burden you want to put on the resident who's filing the variation. My personal feeling is that uh, if, if a resident's filing a variation, we need to, to make it uh, accessible for them. Doesn't mean we have to approve any variation. We still need to look strictly at the, the codes the findings, the criteria for variations, and only approve those that are justified. But um, but we do need to make sure that those who, that, that uh, uh, have legitimate requests for variations can get to us uh, at a reasonable fee. Uh, the next item was um, the possibility of eliminating the cost of the verbatim minutes and going to a tape recording of the audio recording of the of the hearings that uh, could be uh, accessible for anyone. I think the key to this one is, uh, as the zoning board did on that last variation, they made the record clear, I thought, they did an excellent job of clearly stating why they were making their recommendation in short, brief paragraphs. You didn't have to read the verbatim minutes to know what, why they were making their recommendation. And I think as long as we're, they're doing that and staff is then packaging that and presenting that in a, in a co, you know, in, in a, concise format that uh, we can uh, possibly do away with the verbatim minutes and save. That would be the most significant savings in terms of, of, of money. Um, establishing regular meeting dates was something else we talked about. Right now the zoning board has such a low volume of, of business to attend to that they only meet on an as needed basis. So when someone <coughs> files a variation, staff could take a week or two just to figure out when the meeting date's going to be and then they still have to publish the notice 15 to 30 days in advance, so that adds time to the process. Um, one of the, uh, we've talked about consolidating the plan commission and the zoning board. One of the uh, uh, benefits of that consolidation is that uh, you have regular meeting minutes, or regular meeting dates. The plan commission meets once a month. Uh, the staff, if they get a variation, they can tell someone, here's the meeting date, here's the filing deadline. You know, you file by that deadline, you're on that date. And, and, and there's, we save that week or two or the end that uncertainty of not knowing exactly when the meeting dates would be. And then finally, uh, we talked about commercial variations and that you know, the $250 fee really wouldn't be appropriate for commercial variations. And so we talked about having an escrow payment. And this is common, I've seen this in other villages where they require $2,500, $5,000, whatever, escrow payment up front by the applicant in addition to the filing fee. And then if we incur direct costs for the legal notices in the paper, the mailing notices, if we have to consult a landscape architect or a traffic engineer or 
and our attorney, mm -hmm. yeah, all the attorney's fees that are involved, those are billed directly, and, and, the, and we keep track of those. We take that money out of that escrow. When the escrow gets down close to, to zero or 25% or, or whatever, we tell the, the applicant you can't go forward anymore until you replenish this, this, uh, this escrow account. We don't get very many commercial variations, so it's not, it doesn't come up very often, but we thought we should have that in there just to, just to make sure we cover that part of it. So, Trustee Ballerine, anything else? I, you know, I, think this, I think what we, what we what we're putting this together, I, I, if I'm correctly, I, even if you miss a date, I think the total from start to finish was seven weeks. And right. that's if you miss the, 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 the the publication in the newspaper and you have to wait to the next cycle. So this this can reduce things time-wise considerably. And you you stated something that, that I, I think is very important that people understand. This is not a way to make variations easier. It's a way to, that it's a way for you to to have your 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 day easier. Um, but that doesn't mean just because it's easier you, you're going to be able to get anything. I mean, you still everything has to be followed. Everything has to be, you know, the way the way the way we do it now. So um, it's not an attempt to make, you know, variations come coming quick and, and fast. But I do think it's important that we do add that one thing that uh, that the plan or ZBA that they do do a, you know, a uh, uh, defending of their their yeah. vote because I I found that to be very, you know, it was a great idea. I found that to be be very informative. I mean, yeah. you you, ex you knew exactly what they were thinking, and the whole verbatim minutes just went away. And those those statements, those six paragraphs, I knew exactly what was going on. So that was wonderful. Other comments? I just think you did. Guys did a great job on this, and I think it makes the whole process so much more orderly and transparent. I I can't imagine that the residents of Riverside won't be delighted with these types of proposed changes. Are we okay as far as legally meeting the requirements of how these things need to be communicated and, and that type of thing? Yeah, yeah, I, We're I good. think so. I mean, there's that little ambiguity in state law that so many communities do the mailing okay. uh, that way. And also, you're adding the posting, which isn't required. So I don't think you'd have any, you know, if you back up from the, the state requirements and you say, are there any due process concerns, I, I don't think there are any of those. Okay. So, but I think it's a really good idea if you're doing the first class to add the posting, I think mm -hmm. that does a nice mix of covering. Yeah. Cool. The uh, fee, is there any, any thought of the fee reduction to 250 or should there be a, um, a fee class? 250 for projects less than $10,000, 500 for projects over five, you know, over, over $10,000? I mean, is, is, I mean, I just, I, I, you know, I want to, I want to make sure we, 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 we were fair with everything, and, and so I, I agree with you that that 250 is 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 a fair fee when you're talking about smaller projects, but when you're talking about a, you know, a, 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 an addition on a home, especially with some of the ones we saw, there was some significant legal fees that were that were that went along with it. Um, so I can I can see maybe a staggered. Prices. Does that make any sense? Do anybody? you have any benchmarks? I was going to say, have you, have you seen things like that? Yeah, it's very common to have a staggered based on value of the job. Very common. Much like your permit fees. Yeah, very common. Mm -hmm. So, is that is there agreement that we would like to take that approach? So, you can, and you could look at it like our permit fees. And it's also the very common thousand. to have flat fees for residential, but have the escrow for commercial, where you're recouping everything. How do they? How how is? What's the most common way of handling the escrow? A percentage of the project or, or a flat fee? It's usually done as an initial flat fee. You know, usually I, th I think River Forest does. The easiest way would be. Yeah, it's like five thousand or whatever it is, three thousand. Right. Then they. When you get loaded, if something is going on because there's a lot of uh, it, consultants involved or whatever, and it it starts to get low, they ask them to replenish it. Right. So, so just scanning. Do you have this memorandum? Yes. In front of you? So just scanning down at the in terms of of ordinance changes, uh, the first class mail would be. That would be required. That would be required. And right. then adding the posting. Adding the, the posting of the sign. Yes. Um, 
the the changing of the fee to a a, st a staggered structure that that's in the village code um, the, the fees are all listed in the village code as opposed to the zoning ordinance. The verbatim minutes, that's not, that isn't in the code, right? Right. That's just administrative right. detail. Yeah, that was a Correct. practice. It was your practice. The, uh, the regular meeting dates and the concept of the, the combining of the plan commission and zoning board, I mean, that is, that's going to be a major topic during our commission review discussions uh, in October, November. So we can, we can circle back to that one. And then the, we would also need something in, in our, fees with regard to the escrow. Yeah. So is it the board's consensus that we want the attorneys to work work these ordinances up for our consideration? I just, yes, please. Yes, that's my consent. I agree with that. I just, I, one statement on the fee and then I'll, 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 I'll leave it alone. <laughs> for something that, you know, a, a variation that happens once, twice, three times a year at the most, to create this elaborate structured system to me just seems like we're making it more complicated than it needs to be. I'd rather just make it 250. It's not like we're losing out on money, uh, you know. If uh, you know, if, if just because you know our costs are the same on a variation, whether it's an addition to a house or whether it's a fence, our costs are the same. Um, you know, the legal notice, the, uh, the sign posting, you know, et cetera. So, but it, I mean, I, it's a good, it's a logical thing to do. So if that's what the consensus is, that's fine. I'll go along with that. But, you know, just keep that in mind for the next time we, when we do finally vote on this. I just rather keep it simple. I would be interested to know what four or five of our surrounding villages charge for something like this, just so that I understand what the benchmark is. Um, but I do tend to agree with Doug. I mean, I think that in a village like Riverside, where every single lot is a different size and configuration, first of all, any resident runs the risk of requiring a variance more than someone who lives, for instance, on a city of Chicago lot, which has a, a typical configuration. And then, um, to come up with some elaborate scheme for how some people might have to pay more than other people. I just, I don't think it's necessary. I think it's, but I would like to see what other uh, villages surrounding us are for, for something like this. And with regard to the checklist, the staff's already working on that, I think. Okay. So let's, uh, yeah, let's make every effort to get all these pieces in place by November. Is that feasible? Sure. Yeah. Uh, it's just a matter of drafting it and having the public hearing at the plan commission level. And uh, I just don't want to lose sight of this because I think this is this is important. Okay, so we'll we'll come back to this at our first meeting in December. And excellent work, Trustee Mollock and Valerie. Thank you for doing this, and Attorney Mars and Mr. Carraher. This is a nice step forward. Our last item for consideration is a consideration of a temporary moratorium on zoning approvals and business licenses for non-retail tax generating businesses in the portion of the B1 business zoning district from 26th Street on the north to and including the lot immediately south of Long Common. Uh, Peter, do you want to sure. present this? Um, the portion of the B1 business zoning district on Harlem Avenue from 26th Street to and including the parcel just south of Long Common, collectively known as Harlem North Corridor, currently has multiple vacancies. Because of the limited commercial space within the village, the strip of commercial properties represents one of the most concentrated areas for potential retail sales tax generating businesses. The village has recently had preliminary discussions with property owners within this area concerning possible development and that would generate retail sales taxes and be in, collective, and be in the collective best interest of the property owners within the corridor the village and its residents. In order to ensure the village has sufficient time to consider how to best address development in the, in the area, the board may want to consider a temporary moratorium on zoning approvals 
and the issuance of business permits and licenses in the corridor to non-retail uses while it considers whether this area is appropriate for retail overlay district or some zoning amendments that would help ensure the development of this important corridor serves the collective best interests of the property owners within the corridor and the residents of the village. So I would ask our village attorneys to just talk a little bit more for the education both of the board and, and the folks at home about this concept of, of one, the moratorium, the public hearings that would be involved, and also the idea of, uh, of a retail overlay district. So either Mr. Molina or Mr. Morris. I can start, I guess. Sure. The, the, uh, the, the, the concept came about because of the realization as staff was, was working on possibly uh, seeing if there was an interest in redeveloping this area, which as, as you know, has uh, a lot that has a, a strip mall type area with some rather awkward parking and then uh, there's the, the vacant Sara Lee site to the, to the, on, the, on the north part of that. Um, and then uh, just south of Long Common, there's the gas station there, that whole general area. And the idea was with the vacancies there that some landlords um, you know, may move forward because they're looking for tenants and may get locked in to uh, deals that could end up having service businesses that might not involve retail. Uh, and might pose an obstacle to the future redevelopment in general of this area if that's feasible. So in order to kind of put, put people on notice, including the property owners in that area, that the village is serious in trying to see whether something like this would work, would be to do the moratorium, which would give everyone fair notice uh, that non-service related businesses, any leases would, would not be approved uh, the, as far as licensing, anything that would require village approval or zoning approval in the interim would be there in place for a short period of time so the village board could consider whether some for, form of zoning change in that area which would encourage retail uh, w might, might be appropriate and that could serve as a catalyst to see if something beyond that was possible but at the very least to encourage more of a retail use in that area. Uh, so when we're talking about the possible things that might be done, one of those things is uh, a, a retail overlay district. And what that is, is it's called an overlay because the underlying zoning remains the commercial zoning that it is, but it has an overlay over it that creates a special district where the village is singling out areas that are uniquely appropriate to retail use. And, and the current thinking of that is that retail businesses thrive when they can sort of reinforce each other by, by encouraging cross shopping and that sort of thing. So you don't want retail businesses to be orphaned in an area where, where they're providing products uh, uh, and, and they're, they're orphaned in an area with only, like for instance, uh, medical offices or, or a dental office, that kind of thing. Um, and where you do have those that want to go in, if there's been a vacancy for a while, you create the possibility, because you, you don't want uh, landlords to be stuck with something that's, that's vacant for an inordinate, inordinate length of time that would create a real problem often these retail overlay districts provide a variation procedure, a special use or a variation from the retail requirement upon a request of a landlord and a potential tenant and you try to show why you should be entitled to it. And the way many of the retail overlay work, retail overlay districts work is they have within a certain area, you can have a certain percentage of non-retail uses and if you are going over that, then you would need a, a variation or a special use. And, and how those work is you come in similar to a variation. You set up standards that would be in the ordinance that you would need to meet it. And one of the examples, you know, would be one of the things that you would look at, for example, is how this non-retail business, would it either enhance or not negatively affect retail that's already there or that may be there? One good example was in another community recently, there was such a, uh, a request for a variation procedure in a retail overlay, and it was for a retina specialist uh, service. 
And their point was, and I think it was, it was sort of well taken once they developed it based on their practice, was, well, we are not only going to hurt your retail, we are going to help it, we think, because one of the reasons we want to move is our current location is an area right around a busy street where the only thing nearby is, you know, a white castle, and there's nothing close. And the, the reason that we need retail is because our patients are older people that often can't drive, they have retinal issues, almost all of them are, and they're being brought by some younger member of the family or friend who wants somewhere to go while they're waiting. They want to go get a cup of coffee, they want to maybe shop a little bit, they can't do it there. So we actually want to be near retail. That's an example of where the variation process substantively could come into play. So that's how retail overlay works. Uh, there are some other you know, zoning possibilities that, that are also worth looking at, but the idea here tonight is to just see whether there's any interest in that given this vacancy rate you've got. I think one of the things would be, you, again, you would put the property owner, owners there because they would get a notice of, of this as part of the public hearing that would be needed to show that the, the village was very interested in, in having retail be a, a cornerstone in this area. So, so, so procedurally then the way this would work is that there would be a public notice, there would be a public hearing uh, by the plan commission. Right. There would actually be two public hearings actually because we would need to do a quick public hearing to pass the moratorium ordinance which would be for a limited period of time so the village could study the issue. That, you know, usually would be something like 90 days or six months. You probably don't want to go up beyond six months. The longer they are, the more subject they are to ch challenge if they're challenged because the idea is you can't use it as a substitute for actually changing the zoning. It's just a stopgap so that you have time to breathe now that you've become aware of this issue and, and you sort of want to take stock of the situation and you want to do it so everyone knows what the rules of the game are while you develop the final rules of the game if you change them. So it would be that and then, then you would consider what kind of zoning you may want to do there to either encourage retail to encourage redevelopment to create an environment where that would be conducive to that and then you would just need to get that done within the period of the moratorium. Of course any permanent changes to your zoning court code also require a public hearing. So we would have to go through that process and get it done within the period of the moratorium. I've also seen moratoriums extended. You know, we try to not to get to that point because again, it creates a potential problem. Okay, just, just a few more points on this. Uh, I mean, I think we're all, we're all familiar with, with the area that we're talking about. The village in, in the past several years has already made a, a several attempts to get a kind of global development of that area. Uh, several years ago, we did have an opportunity with a, a potential Starbucks going into that area, but then the market collapse came along and Starbucks stopped building Starbucks. Uh, so the, 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 what I find attractive about this is it would be an opportunity for us to focus on really one of the only areas in our village that has a, has a substantial opportunity for retail, sac, retail and, and sales tax generation for those properties. Now, I, want, I, I, I do want to make clear, though, that the, that the, current, uh, the current, what we all call a Phil Sara Lee building, uh, there is already an existing lease in place for that building. So it, with regard to this moratorium, that existing lease with the, with the financial institution that is scheduled to go in there would not be affected by, by, this, by this moratorium. However, if, the, if, if we ended up, if after all the public hearings and all the public comment and the input from both the residents and the businesses in that area, if we did do a, a retail district overlay or have some other zoning ordinances that would be passed with regard to the, to the corridor, uh, in the future, a, any, any future tenant or any future owner of that building would be affected by the changes. But this would not affect the the uh, lease that's already been signed by that by that building owner. So this is the concept. Uh, I'm interested to hear what everyone else thinks. I think it's an interesting idea. Um, it certainly will give us time to see how this Costco plays out on that other corner of 26 and 
problem. A lot of times when you get a development, a big box development like that, you'll get spider development around it. Um, where I think more retail-based businesses will come in than service-based, wanting to be near the big box stores to get some of the overflow. Do any of our neighboring communities have these retail overlay districts, Lance? Uh, City of Berwyn has one. River Forest does not, they use a different procedure though where they require like a PUD process to do certain things mm -hmm. that does a similar kind of, kind of serves a similar function. Oh, oh, uh, Oak Park, Oak Park, Oak Park yeah. has right, a big, mm -hmm. big one. Uh, so it is, it is fairly common uh, in, in key areas because of community's interest in the sales tax and because of the interest usually at the request of retail businesses to try to get that, that cross selling. So uh, have, have any of those communities had any significant challenges to their retail overlay districts? Oh, legal? No, I'm not, a, I'm not aware of any challenges to the, to the retail overlay. They're pretty well established as long as they're set up right. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that would be interesting to me about this is it would really focus the, the board's attention. You know, it, kind of the, the grill in the room for a long time has been, you know, what can we do mm -hmm. as a village government to help facilitate Mm -hmm. developments of this sort. Uh, and it may be that there's nothing much mm -hmm. that we can do other than provide a supportive environment. Mm -hmm. But but this, if, if there's any place in our village right now that seems to me that that discussion could be focused, mm -hmm. it's this particular North Harlem corridor. So. I do believe Mike makes a good point, though, that uh, what's happening in the current market may help take care of our problem. Mm -hmm. And when you say retail, so a restaurant would be retail. Yeah, anything mm -hmm. that generates sales tax, as opposed to services. It, it, the reason the, the distinction is made is services are not taxed with sales tax in Illinois. Okay. Some areas of the country they are, but they are not in Illinois. So when you provide a service, if you charge $20 for your service, you, you don't pay sales tax on it. But if it's a product, anything that would generate the retail sales tax is retail. So services that are currently in there would not be affected. Correct. But one thing, one thing that is true is if there was an interest in redevelopment and the owners were interested, they could, for instance, non-renew a lease, even though the, the business might have a, a right to stay there if they don't renew the lease because they're interested in exploring the redevelopment. You know, it could right. it could help serve as a catalyst to that. So, do I sense a consensus that we would like to move forward with this? Yes. 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 Okay. So, I assume then the next step would be a, a public hearing at our next meeting. Correct. And then yep. we'll move well, forward. No, oh, it, it, we, yeah. we have to do a uh, public hearing at the moratorium at the planning commission, and then the ordinance comes back to you. So, I thought you uh, so. I thought you said we had to have one first before plan. There, no, it's, no, no, no. Matt, there are two public hearings, both of which will be held by the plan commission. The one will be for the moratorium, and then you'll approve that here. I see. And okay. then any Got substantive it. zoning changes are amendments to your zoning code proper, and those would require a separate public hearing okay. at a later date. Got it. Depending on what you decide. Okay. Thank you. So that's all of our uh, formal items. Does anyone have any new business that they would like to bring up? I, I would if you wouldn't. Would, uh, wouldn't mind. Um, you know, I, I just want to get everyone up to date on, on what's happening with the Riverside Cable Commission and, and uh, Network 6. Because um, over the last six months, nine months, a lot of things have, have, have come about. And this actually was, was brought about by um, a resident the other day said, Wow, I wish I was, I wanted to see the board meeting, but I don't get Comcast. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, we have the capability, we are on YouTube. Um, all you have to do is go to YouTube, Google RTV Net 6, and you will be able to view all of the current board meetings as well as the archive videos of the board meeting if you have a boring night. Um, you will also be able to see the township uh, meetings. And as of the um, first uh, meeting in August, uh, District 96, the school board is also um, on on, um, on YouTube and will also be on the. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Date night. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll also be on on, on the uh, Net6 TV. Um, so I, again, I would like to commend both the township and D96 because they actually have paid 
uh, financial support for the airing of their meetings and their commitment to open and transparent government. Um, you will also be able to see the 3rd and 4th of July, the concerts on there, the parades on there, Raw's on there, car shows are on there, removal of the dam is on there. There's a lot of stuff on there. And in 2014, um, we're intending on launching a, our, our Riverside TV website which would be easier for you to link up to these different videos. So wherever there's an internet connection, you can be at home. <laughs> and Joe repeated it's RTV Net 6. RTV Net 6, yes. Okay. Um, and I'd like to, and I don't know if we can get these people in front of us because they're all here. Uh, Lorenzo Cordova, who's our technical director, he's probably outside playing with the uh, controls. Uh, Jordan Manns, uh, Rachel Sammons, who just wrote a book who just left out, uh, Jason Gu, uh, Colin Hughes, Michael Flushmore, David Carafa, and Jacob Patelka are all our PAs that work for us. And Karina Turner, uh, I'm sorry, Karina Turner of Turner Network um, is, the, is the director that takes care of everybody. And then the cable commissioner, Steve Wojcik, Don Farnham, Eric Sundstrom, Mark Yurkov, and our chair, Greg Gorski. Thank you. That's like the trailing credits at the end. Yeah, <laughs> you sounded like you were accepting an Academy Award. <laughs> and you will, you'll be able to see a great shoot that they did at the betrayal. They have uh, interviews with the different people, the actors, the uh, guy that blew up the car, um, the guy, the director. So it's, it's, it was an eight minute, it was wonderful. So that'll be airing shortly. Okay. Any other new business? Hearing none, we do have a need for an executive session tonight that will include discussion of litigation as well as a discussion of the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees. No final action will be taken during this meeting and we shall not reconvene. So with that, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Motion. Motion by Mr. Just Foley. Make, just to make clear, it's uh, pending litigation. Pending litigation. Motion by Mr. Foley. Second. Second by Mr. Ballerain. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Aye. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Foley. Aye. The meeting is adjourned.